Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Greg LeClaire. I'll be moderating the uh, uh, technical session C today, um, the business of mining. I'd um, like to introduce our first uh, speaker today, uh, Joe Havasi. Joe is the Director of Natural Resources for Compass Minerals International of Overland, Kansas, Park, Overland Park, Kansas. Joe is responsible for managing real estate, mineral reserves, water rights, and land use planning. Joe is a geologist by training, having completed undergraduate studies at Denison University, a small school in uh, Ohio, completed coursework towards a master's in geology at the Ohio State University, and received an MBA from Youngstown State University. Joe joined Compass Minerals in 2010 to lead its natural resources function and resides in Pleasant View, Utah. Welcome, Joe, and thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor uh, to be talking to all of you um, and uh, look forward to, uh, to uh, presenting uh, what we do here in, uh, in Ogden, Utah, on the shores of the Great Salt Lake and in the Great Salt Lake, and uh, happy to field any questions at the end. A little bit about Compass Minerals. We're headquartered in the Kansas City area. Uh, we're a publicly listed company uh, trading in the New York Stock Exchange under ticker symbol CMP. Our history goes back to 1844 um, uh, in the UK. And we have two major divisions, the salt and plant nutrition business. We have uh, operations in four countries, uh, US, Canada, UK, and Brazil. Quite a diverse portfolio of operations. Um, our, our primary business uh, is, is salt. We have three underground salt mines, uh, one in Cope Blanche, Louisiana, in a, uh, in a salt dive pier uh, on, on the coast. Um, Goderich, Ontario, on the shores of Lake Huron, about due east of um, Saginaw, Michigan. And then the Winsford Salt Mine in the UK, which is the only uh, active salt mine uh, in the UK. We also have uh, solution mines. Um, uh, we, we, we mine the salt at, at depth with, uh, and, and bring it to solution and then evaporate in the mechanical evaporation plant. Uh, we have operations in Nova Scotia, uh, Ontario, Lyons, Kansas, and uh, Unity, Saskatchewan. We have a sulfate of potash business uh, here in, in, as well as magnesium chloride in, in Ogden and uh, an ion exchange uh, sulfate of potash operation in Winyard, Saskatchewan. We do have some packaging plants uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes area, and uh, we actually have a records management business in the UK where we use um, uh, historic uh, old, old mine workings uh, to store documents and other uh, valuables. We have a number of operations in, in Brazil, uh, more uh, on a plant nutrition side of things and uh, more blending plants than anything, uh, servicing mainly soybeans and, and other row crops in, uh, in Brazil. A little bit about Ogden, Utah's operations. Uh, you may know us as, uh, as Great Salt Lake Minerals or GSL, uh, but we, we changed names in uh, August of 2014 and we go by Compass Minerals Ogden now. It's the same ownership. Uh, we have a, a manufacturing plant and produce three main products, salt, magnesium chloride, and potassium sulfate. We have 370 employees. And if you've ever flown uh, into Salt Lake Airport, uh, from the north, you've probably seen our evaporation ponds. So 24,000 acres of them in, uh, in, uh, in Bear River Bay, uh, part of Great Salt Lake. And then on the west side, uh, Climbing Bay in the north arm, about 30,000 acres. We initiated operation in 1970. So just a really high level overview, you can see the Great Salt Lake here. Um, the lake is, is bifurcated by the uh, UP Causeway that stretches from Climbing Bay all the way to Promontory Point. Um, and the reason it's red is there's a, an algae that, that can survive in, in hypersaline conditions, which is the, the case in the North Arm. Uh, North Arm is, uh, is, is saturated uh, in, in sodium chloride, so it's about 27% sodium chloride. And uh, there's only, the only inflow uh, to the North Arm is through, uh, through two bridges uh, in the causeway, um, fairly narrow. Uh, the, the south arm receives all the inflow from the basin, so um, it, it's a bit less saline, uh, about 
15% versus the 27% in the north arm. We have our, our west pond operations, as I mentioned before, uh, over here in Climbin Bay, and then our east ponds in, in Bear River Bay. Just a bit more detail uh, in terms of the uh, location of our ponds. On the west side here, uh, we have 30,000 acres of ponds. So just a really basic cartoon of, of what we do in solar evaporation. We, we uh, feed the brine in from, um, from the north arm of the Great Salt Lake, feed it into our ponds and, and evaporate uh, the water off. And various salts will precipitate at different, different uh, concentrations and different times. And ultimately the targeted mineral deposit is laid down uh, in our harvest ponds and we'll, uh, we'll do an annual harvest um, uh, of those deposits. And then sodium chloride will, will, will drop out first and then the potash salts uh, second and then magnesium chloride being the most resilient, um, we'll harvest that as a brine actually. So the West Pond system uh, in Climbing Bay and the North Arm, what we do is we have an intake canal, it goes about six miles into the lake. Um, when we constructed the West Ponds in 1992, uh, we constructed the, the, the ponds in the lake, actually. So the lake has receded quite a bit, six miles out. Um, so we, we do bring uh, the, canal, uh, the brine in via intake canal. We have a, uh, a battery of uh, a pump station, uh, 12, 20,000 gallon per minute pumps pumping uh, the, the brine in. And we'll pump uh, from March uh, through S September uh, into our ponds. Uh, we'll bring it in the brine at 0.6% potassium and we'll send it via the Barron's Trench um, to the east side at 1.2% K. Barron's Trench is, uh, is a really unique uh, feat of engineering. Um, the bathymetry of the north arm kind of works in our favor where we'll pump the brine in uh, to uh, an excavated trench that we excavated in, in the early 90s. And uh, the bathymetry is such that you have a flow from west to east. And uh, over a seven day uh, transit time, we'll recover that brine in the, um, in, uh, at our pump station on Promontory Point. And I'll show you a map uh, here in a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll recover that 21 mile long trench. And uh, it's uh, kind of the world's biggest lava lamp um, is, is the best way to describe it. And we take advantage of the, the uh, higher density uh, in the brine that we pump into the trench relative to the north arm and it flows neatly uh, along, the, along the bottom of the trench. Just a, a photo of our, um, of our pump stations, uh, brings the brine into, um, into the ponds. And then the Barron's Trench. Our East Pond system is, uh, is, is broken up into the three main products, the, East, the salt harvest area where we'll, we'll mine uh, the halite and uh, we do about 1.5 million tons of, uh, of halite and uh, serving a, a range of um, range of markets, uh, including uh, highway de-icing, uh, pool salts, water conditioning, and ag salt. Um, potash, so the, the SOP, uh, it's a niche form of, of potash in that it's chloride free. This is a sulfate based potash and uh, it serves high, higher end, higher margin um, crops. So mainly fruit and nut crops. Uh, those crops cannot sustain uh, chlorides. So uh, they need the potassium, uh, obviously, but uh, can't sustain the chloride. So this is a, this is a great way to deliver uh, potassium to those, those crops. And then we have the mag chloride uh, brine storage uh, in the south. Just a little bit about our processes. Uh, you know, what, what you'd probably assume, we'll, we'll, we'll harvest it, wash it for the salt, uh, dry and screen it, then crush and compact package um, for, for um, consumer uh, salts um, and roughly the same process in the, in the potash. We'll harvest the salt to drop out September through May. We just recently converted to um, uh, converted um, uh, harvest systems um, uh, th this year and it's working very well. Again, we do about one and a half million tons of salt a year. Uh, road salt, water conditioning, animal nutrition. Uh, that harvest was September through November and the spring harvest March to May. You may recognize some of these products. Um, we're, uh, we're present in Ace Hardware, uh, Lowe's, uh, for the water conditioning side uh, market, as well as the um, uh, de-icing, consumer de-icing. And our 
ag product line. So a little bit about the lake. Um, I was, I'm actually a corporate employee headquartered in Kansas City, but I, uh, I moved out to Utah uh, in 2017. Um, because there's there's so much so much going on on, on the lake, and uh, our mineral reserve is actually the the, the the brine in the lake, so it ebbs and flows with with snowpack and lake level and 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 whatnot. So there's there's a, a lot of different uh, committees and commissions, water rights, leases, and and and, and the like. So uh, I just moved out to Utah uh, three years ago, and and one of the one of the major reasons is the the the, the flow into the lake has been diminishing. Um, as we've had uh, population uh, increases in the, in the basin, um, there's more demand for water and, and more diversions that are occurring upstream. And uh, some of that water is getting intercepted. Uh, the three, the, the major inflows are the Bear River uh, to the north, uh, about 55%, the Weber River at 12%, and the Jordan River at 26%. The lake has a, has a number of uses outside of Outside of mineral extraction, uh, you do have brine shrimp, a brine shrimp industry, and it's it's one of the largest in, in the world. Um, you have a number of POTWs that discharge into the lake as well, and that actually is supportive of the brine shrimp. Then you have recreation and uh, and, and ecosystem services, uh, bird watching and uh, observation. As I was mentioning before, um, the population growth in Utah. Uh, while well, great from a market perspective, just creates some, some challenges in terms of managing a mineral reserve. When we initiated operations in 1970, there were about a million people uh, in the state. Uh, it, it's, I, I did this slide in 2015, but we, uh, we surpassed 3 million people in 2015 with the projected population of 6 million uh, in 2060. Um, as that population growth uh, occurs, there's more um, competition um, for water resources, and uh, it's something we, we certainly watch. Then the, the, the web of, of, of what's a mineral right in, in the lake, it's, it's uh, not a typical mine site where they, you'd have the, the four corners of your lease and all the mineral uh, therein. Um, it's it's a, a myriad of things. We have lake bed leases with, uh, with the Utah DNR, Fire, Forestry, and State Grants. So all of our all of our lake leases are through that organization. We have upland leases with CITLA. Uh, we have water rights. So um, it's a unique form of a water right in the, in the brine right, but that's administered through the DNR uh, Division of Water Rights. We have a royalty agreement uh, separate from everything else with, uh, with uh, fire, forestry, and state lands. Uh, you have Corps of Engineers interaction for any kind of construction and maintenance. And, uh, and then we're regulated by DOGM uh, from a mineral extraction standpoint. So if any one of these pieces is missing, uh, you don't have a mineral right. So it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than our typical sort of underground or station mine uh, leases or patented rights um, uh, from that standpoint. The other, the other piece is sort of how the, the lake is, is carved up. Um, the lake is defined by what's known as the meander line and shown in green. So anything within that, within that is uh, sovereign lands of, uh, of the state and uh, and managed by uh, fire forestry and state lands. You then have water policy areas administered by the division of water rights. So it's, it's, uh, it's a bit surreal in that you have water different water policy um, policies uh, in different parts of the same open water body. <laughs> so that's, that uh, creates some challenges from a, a water rights uh, standpoint. Uh, moving on. Just to show you what, what we're what we're looking at from a, a lake level standpoint, the, the average elevation of the lake is, is generally known to be 4199, 4199 feet above mean sea level. Um, last week we hit that was uh, in 2011, and the lake has been in, in pretty steady decline. The the, the blue line is the uh, is the south arm, where, uh, the part that receives all the inflow, and the purple line is the the, the north arm, um, that's um, sort of a, a, a captive uh, water body. Separate, separated more or less. Um, so the lake is, uh, is, is pretty low right now. We're uh, 4194.6 at the moment in the north arm. And uh, you might notice in, in this area, uh, around 2015 to uh, 16, the, um, the railroad causeway was sort of blocked off. And um, they constructed one of, the, one of the primary bridges in 2016 and, and cut it in December of 16. 
what happened uh, as, as a result of plugging the, uh, plugging the causeway uh, for, for a couple of years was the north arm was severed from the rest of the lake. So you, you saw kind of a precipitous decline uh, in lake elevation of the north arm. Um, but when they cut the, uh, the bridge, uh, snapped back up, and you, you, generally, you generally expect about a six inch uh, head difference, uh, south arm being higher than, than the north arm. So you're always getting inflow into the north. And it's a, uh, it's a beautiful setting out. If you, uh, I'm, I'm blessed with being able to go out to our ponds uh, once in a while and, uh, and, and see the, the beautiful landscape. This is a photo of our, our west pond. That's it. Any questions? Well, Joe, thank you very much oh. for an excellent presentation and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, our second speaker is uh, Bob Schaefer. He's the founder and CEO of Eagle Mines Management and also the current president of the SME. Robert Schaefer is a registered professional geologist with 30 plus years international experience for mineral deposits and structuring business transactions globally, having worked in more than 80 countries notably Russia, Australia, Afghanistan, China, India, and most countries in Africa and South America. Robert's an active member of the Society of Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration, and like I said, he's the, the current president in a very interesting year. Um, Bob, uh, thanks for presenting today, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Greg. I could have to ask Liz to put up my slides because for some reason my computer went down in my office. So I'm sitting in someone else's office at the present time. Great. Well, I'm generally honored to be here today and to support Utah Mining, as well as promote greater cooperation and greater collaboration between the Utah Mining Association and SME, especially its local Salt Lake section. We good guys all need to stick together, you know. With that, I'm gonna start a, just a short SME promotion, hoping I might recruit uh, a member or two. Next slide. Oh my. Uh, Liz, could you full screen it? Okay, can you move to the next slide then, please? I'll just, SMEs, as you probably know, is an international organization. We've got nearly 14,000 members that offer a world, and we offer worldwide professional development and global networking opportunities to our members. SME sections also offer professional development opportunities and provide local services to the public as well. SME sections like the Salt Lake section strengthens our mission to serve the mining community and to support the advancement of the industry. I'm not seeing any advancement in the slides. Okay, how do I, okay, I guess. Okay, so I hope you realize we believe we put on the best conferences Published leading edge and timely technical papers and public and periodicals. One mind, if you've never heard of it, is a tremendous library of technical publications that continues to grow as SME, CIM, AUSIMM, South Africa Institute of Mining, NIOSH, and the Mining Societies of Peru and Chile continue adding materials to this online uh, library that's grown to be over 300,000 uh, different publications at the present time. And the participation in that is also included as part of your SME membership. Going to the next slide, 
uh, you can make connections and you can meet some of the leaders of our industry as well as experts in your area by attending our events or networking with our events. And you can find job openings or perhaps the next uh, employee that'll be a great contribution to your company at our career site. You can also share as we're doing today, your professional perceptions and, and improve the quality of knowledge of other members who are attending. On the next slide, you can see we, we have a promotion going on right now in which you can get a free trial membership by going to the uh, promo code that's shown there, LS2020. There you can access all this good stuff plus SME Daily News. On the next slide, if you've got any questions or want more information, please connect with Rachel Grimes. She's our membership chair and will help you out. Now I'll get into the meat of the discussion I'm pre presenting today. Some thoughts on the challenges of funding future mineral exploration. And have, much of this can also really apply to mining companies as well. Going to the next slide, you're looking at a graph that plots the number of world-class or tier one discoveries and tier two discoveries over time. You can see that the, most, the, the strongest focus has been on gold discovery with the yellow color making up the bulk of the, of the graph, perhaps except during the time period following World War II when a tremendous number of base metal deposits, notably porphyry coppers were discovered. This rapid jump probably as a result of the US government's war effort as the War Department really wanted to inventory all the mineral occurrences and resources in the United States in case the war protracted for a great deal of time. In the 1970s, a lot changed when the price of gold was set free to find its own market price and stimulated a lot of exploration and therefore a lot of discoveries. A final reason for the, the growth that you see in exploration discovery in the, in, the, in the graph is that really we added a lot of new technologies, both in drilling as well as exploration technologies particularly geophysics, as they became more and more useful in making new discoveries. Moving to the next slide, the pink bars show the value of the global mineral discoveries annually on a global basis with normal boom and bust peaks and troughs and new business cycles. The red line shows the trend of annual exploration expenditures. All was really going pretty well until about 2007, 2008. The values of the discoveries no longer matched or exceeded the money spent to find them on a global basis. Individual companies had successes, but as an industry, we were, we were actually destroying value. The next slide is another way to look at this value destruction or negative return on exploration investment. Over about 12 years, nearly $200 billion was spent on discovery, yielding only 81 new world-class and tier two discoveries valued at less than $100 billion, or looking at it in hard cold facts, 47 cent return on each dollar spent. The investors in mining were not very, are not very happy. And why is this happening? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I can guarantee you it's not because geologists are getting dumber. Easy deposits sticking out of the ground near infrastructure have long been found and exploited. Deeper covered deposits are today's targets, and they are often located in, in the more his, inhospitable and remote and high cost locations. A lot of prospective terrain ha, as well has been declared off limits to mining, so areas fertile for discovery are not currently accessible. Moving to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about who's making these discoveries, and it's changed over time. Up to about 1990, the major companies with their big budgets Exploration departments, research programs, and, and large experienced staffs had most of the success. But about 1990, this changed as the junior exploration stepped up to become more successful as this part of the in, in this part of the industry. The big company geo staffs exited to join the junior sector for better rewards in terms of stock options and bonuses for their success. Junior companies could make faster decisions as well that allowed corporate that, that uh, allowed quick changes in parties, exploration locations, 
and strategies almost on an instantaneous basis. These, this new breed of exploration geologists were risk takers and better rewards came along with the, their calculated risks. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about mineral exploration as a business over time. We saw this same slide a little earlier, but without the red circles. Business and global population migration led to, large, led to a large degree of discovery over this time. We can see the California gold rush in the 1840s and 50s, the opening of the American West, the Australian gold discoveries and the South African gold rushes in the 1880s and to the 1900s. Turn to the Great Depression, you see a lot of people because of unemployment turned to prospecting and discoveries were made then. Then post-World War II in the Korean War era really became the opening for corporate exploration. This is when exploration really became a business and then the need for consistent large scale funding was required for success. Turning to the next slide, these are statistics very hot off the presses so they only came out about two weeks ago. Global exploration spending is estimated for 2020 at $8.7 billion. Seems like a big number, but it's really a decline of over more than 10% compared to last year. Gold takes the largest chunk of this at more just over half, but, and it's up by about $50 million this year. Copper claims about one fifth of the total spending, but it's down by well over half a billion dollars since 2019. Zinc plus lead and nickel together account for only about 10% of the spending, but it too is down by a combined $135 million over last year. So where's the money spent? Latin America enjoys about a quarter of the, the attention. Together, Australia and Canada receive about 32% of the total, while Africa attracts about 12%. The United States is underappreciated at 10%, and Asia gets a small 3% portion of the exploration activity. The rest of the world, meaning Europe, the Middle East, Russia, and China, get about 14%. Moving to the next slide, we'll talk about where exploration is going in the future. With the new election results, as well as the recent societal pressures, we're trying to move away from carbon-based energy. So what are we gonna use? Energy sources that are sustainable, consistent, would be nuclear power, geothermal power, water power from oceans or rivers as tides and currents. Solar energy, wind energy are notoriously inconsistent using today's technologies. However, they still rely on products we produce for mining. Small scale batteries based on lithium, cobalt, nickel, graphite, and other metals will suffice it to power small tools, automobiles, appliances, and so on. However, large quantities of electricity to support the electric grids that power large regions and populations will require the creation of a hybrid energy system that combines several electricity sources and storage capacity mechanisms that, re that require and consume really large quantities of mined materials. More importantly, to make this transition to a high technology, clean electrical society, the transmission and storage infrastructure will require modernization, capacity expansion, and compatibility across the world. All of this will require tremendous increases in the use and demand for mined and processed materials, not just copper, but also iron and steel, construction materials, and eventually almost every commodity that we produce. If the world is going to be an interconnected technology-based society, mining is a necessity. To address climate change demands of a decarbonized world energy and energy sources, mining is required. And for society to be sustainable, mining is an absolute must. Moving to the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about responsible and sustainable mining. As mining becomes ever more important in the future, as I've just mentioned, to carry out this complete transition, of our industry must be both responsible and sustainable to fulfill its role with future generations and communities, all the while improving our social perception and acceptability. We hear lots of words like sustainable mining, responsible mining, social responsibility, social license to operate and, and, and things like that. 
Right now, I'm going to focus specifically on the words responsible and sustainable and what they mean in the context of mining. Responsible mining has been described as the principle that mineral, that the mining of minerals and metals should benefit economies, improve the lives of people, and respect the environment and ecosystems, all the while benefiting mining companies in a fair and viable way. These performance expectations are measured in the context of economic, environmental, social, and governance matters we know today as ESG. Financing our projects cannot be done by having a good, just a good credit rating now or high return on investment or a good NPV alone. You also will now need a good ESG score. Banks and major investment funds are already applying these standards and I'm gonna address them in a little more detail in a little while. So responsible mining looks at the way our mining industry operates today with respect to people, the environment and regulators. These organizations provide, there are organizations that provide guidelines for operating performance in ESG, such as the ICMM, the International Council on Mining and Minerals. Almost all the major mining companies of the world, as well as important technical societies like SME, belong to this organization. Sustainable mining is commonly discussed almost interchangeably with responsible mining. It's really not fully correct to say this. Applying sustainability principles to mining is inherently challenging because mining is a, an act of removing con and consuming a limited mineral resource. Just as responsible mining looks at the mineral industry performance today, sustainability really looks to the future. Sustainable mining defined as meeting present day needs without compromising the needs for future generations. This concept is increasingly incorporated into mine development planning as the demand for minerals and products of mining and the, their environmental impacts associated with minerals extraction are currently more, more closely scrutinized and, and assessed. Looking at the next slide, we're gonna get a little better idea of what ESG is. <clears throat> the mining industry affect all three dimensions of sustainability, both positively and negatively. We are right to recognize that the industry's contribution of minerals and materials is absolutely a necessity for the technological transformation of global society and systems. There's also a recognition that addressing climate change becomes a difficult, if not impossible, problem to solve without mining. The world cannot decarbonize without greatly expanding the consumption of many other products of the earth, not just copper, iron, rare earth elements, and construction materials but also nearly all of the elements of the periodic table that are lighter than uranium to achieve a so-called green society. Moving to the next slide, at the same time, the industry wrestles with other sustainability challenges because many of, us, of its activities are, in many respects, not forever. The mining and mineral industry and the value chains it supplies are at the forefront of technology and expertise and innovation in many areas. But a key question remains, how can the mining industry contribute to the transformation to a sustainable future society while dealing with the depletion of natural resources? This is a key dilemma for the future, but we need to start addressing and providing answers for that right now. Moving on to the next slide, I'm gonna start looking at it from an investor's perspective. The investor, Banker's decision to finance a mining project historically has been based on the numbers and on the people. In today's world, however, NPVs, IRRs, all in sustaining cost, payback period, mine life, and those sorts of numbers are not the only ones under, under consideration. Similarly, management teams with the pedigree for profitable operations and familiarity with markets is probably not sufficient to get a funding on either. Today's high scores relating to corporate performance in the subjective areas of responsible and sustainable mining, known as ES performance indicators, or activities that relate to environment, social, and government programs, hold considerable weight in deciding which mining projects will get built. So how does the mining industry engage the investment community to provide 
the answers that green society wants. We as companies and as an industry must meet or exceed their expectations in the realm of ESG performance. We should look at ESG as part of a normal course of business. Reporting standards are always changing in the areas of accounting with GAAP and IFRS changes and in operating performance, 43-101 reporting, reserve reports, and so on. Just ask any CEO or CFO. The mining industry must and is trying to get out in front of the issue with ESG operational guidelines that have been developed by ICMM and others. Corporate ESG performance should, should be a key part of corporate risk oversight by the board of directors of your company. Transparency when providing corporate updates need to expand from operational reviews and financial updates to include, e, include ESG performance reports in your 10K and 10Q filings, as well as investor updates. The view to the public, to the regulators, and to the investment community is that companies that perform well in the areas of ESG are almost always high performers operationally and financially. It's a, it is also an issue of corporate reputation and whether a company is a preferred business partner. ESG is just becoming another KPI that a company has analyzed for project or corporate financing. Just ask BlackRock, Orion, JP Morgan, BMO, SockGen. Just last month, a spokesman for the $7.8 trillion BlackRock Equity Fund stated that they are supportive of developing harmonized sustainability measures and standards to make it simpler for companies and investors to report and assess sustainability risk and track how well companies are transitioning to a low carbon economy so as to assist with their investment strategies and decisions. So moving to the next slide, we're gonna look a little bit at traditional financing. Today, as with the past 30 years or so, typically mineral explorers and mines have turned to the public to finance their dreams of discovery and wealth. A team forms a public company and go and goes on to a stock exchange. The Toronto Stock Exchange and its little brother, the Toronto Venture Exchange, do more than, of this than any other in the world. However, Australia is not far behind and some ASX listed companies, pardon me, <clears throat> have come out venturing into the, out of the Southern Hemisphere to snatch up some really attractive assets in North America. The US OTC or over-the-counter pink sheets, as well as the Frankfurt exchanges are also gained, but they're there to a far lesser degree. Private equity has been filling in by both providing funds <clears throat> to acquire and acquire equity states, not just in the project, but in the companies themselves over the last decade. These would include Orion, Pacific Road, Resource Capital Funds, and Sprott. Purchasing a royalty or even creating a royalty by direct payment to a mining property owner is also becoming quite common. Franco Nevada of Cisco Royalties, Royal Gold, and Ely Royalties are some of the best performing stocks today as their revenues are not burned by overhead costs that are high and don't suffer cash calls to finance expansions and, and things of the like. Their risks are limited and the profit margins are high. Metal streaming has also become the newest of the traditional players in the mining finance world. The streamer is, is in essence buying metal in the ground before it's produced at a steep discount as a source of construction finance. Then it pays a top up price when the product is delivered that commonly reflects an operating cost. In the end, the streamer has probably acquired the physical metal at about two thirds of the value and can sell it into the markets at a high profit margin. And the real upside is that if metal prices have risen since the initial deal, and then the price rise is really just an added bonus. It's a pretty good business. Wheat and precious metals and metal are great examples of this business model. Sometimes royalty companies and even private equity, group, equity groups will also take on a, a metal production stream to sweeten their deal. Moving to the next slide, we look a little bit at non-traditional mining finance. 
Getting funds to advance your favorite project outside of normal channel channels is becoming accessible. Surprisingly, crowdfunding is showing up to finance exploration projects recently. A company in the United Kingdom, Cornish Lithium, opened up a crowdfunding campaign through Crowdcube to pre-registered investors and the amount they raised smashed through their target of 1.5 million pounds in the initial hours of their investment, hitting 3 million pounds or double their, their goal before at the end of the day. Other players in that sphere include Red Cloud, which is based in Toronto, who recently funded IDC, Monday, IDC mining with crowdfunding. Others include Mineral Intelligence, also based in Toronto, and the Exploration Funder, based in New York City. Last month, the, inter the Interactive Investor and Investment Newsletter ran an article that was entitled, Does Mining Have a Place in an ESG Portfolio? Similarly, Stockhead's Ethical Investing Series asked if mining can be an ethical investment. It goes without saying mining can negatively impact the environment and communities. But it also can create economic growth through employment and tax revenue, as well as build infrastructure in remote areas. Is the trade-off therefore worth it? In short, it depends. Stockhead spoke with several industry experts and the consensus was mining can be ethical in many circumstances. Groups like BlackRock, Epworth, Australian Ethical, and others that I've shown on the slide have ESG checklists, much like that of ICMM, and their 10 Mining with Principles guidelines shown here. So what do ethical investors look for in miners and explorers? It really boils down to five things. Quality of the asset and the people, liquidity in the market, a pathway to a, to a share price uplift or re-rating as a result of environmental, social, and corporate governance activities, the ESG compliance, and finally, a, uh, the part that the mining industry can't control, does the company and the project fit their investment portfolio? So in summary, I might be so bold to suggest that the mining industry can move into this direction Get it by getting its ESG housing established and its operations running optimally. At some point, the so-called ethical investment funds will, will be looking to invest in our industry because we will be the ESG leaders. And they like to make money too. So on the, the next slide, to bring this dis discussion to a conclusion, we've discussed a number of topics relating to exploration and business aspects, mining its role in the greener future, and responsible and sustaining mining as it relates to finance and the mineral industry. In addition, we've discussed how the mining industry will be a critical and key player as society is transformed to a more sustainable future. We recognize that there will be an increased demand for the products that the mining industry produces. Our industry will be a key player, and I want to emphasize our mining leadership to our mining leadership that they will need to be committed to developing and adopting the technologies that will lead to cleaner minds and improved social perception of our industry. Finally, in the last slide, can our industry carry out this mission while adopting the principles of responsible and sustainable mining? That's a question that we as an industry, as well as individual corporations, must answer for ourselves. Because if we don't, those answers will be dictated to you. And I thank you for your time today, and I hope I can answer any questions that might come along. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, very informative uh, presentation. My pleasure. If there's a question, I'm happy to take it. Otherwise, feel free to contact me through SME. I think we'll leave it to the end uh, to maybe catch any questions to get going on the third uh, presentation. Um, our third presentation and final presentation of this session is uh, uh, Mark Chalmers. Mr. Chalmers is the President and S Chief Executive Officer of Energy Fuels, a position he's held since February 1st of 2018. From, 21, from July 1st, 2017 to January 31st, 2018, Mr. Chalmers was President and Chief Operating Officer of Energy Fuels, and from July 1st, 2016 to 
July 1st, 2017, he was Chief Operating Officer of the corporation. Mr. Chalmers has also consulted to several of the largest players in the uranium the supply sector, including BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto, uh, Moraveni, and until recently served as the chair of the Australian Uranium Council, a position he, he held for 10 years. Mark, thanks for being here today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and it's my pleasure to talk about energy fuels and, and uh, our significant position in Utah and we're emerging as America's leading producer of critical uh, minerals. Uh, and I'll talk about our uh, uranium business, vanadium business, and our emerging rare earth elements business, which we're very excited about. Look, and I might make some forward looking statements. I'll try to limit it to be due to this audience, but uh, uh, this is basically the quarterly um, uh, investment uh, conference uh, a call presentation that I made last week. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, background on energy fuels, uh, and, and I actually started working with a number of these assets back in the 70s and 80s. Some of them were owned by a Union Carbide uh, back in the days of your van and a number of the mines that were in Utah, like the LaSalle complex. Uh, we are the largest producer of uranium in the United States. Uh, that's kind of a consolation prize because there's so little uranium produced in the United States uh, at this point in time. Uh, we have more assets. We can respond quicker, faster than anyone else when it comes to uranium production. We also have the only uh, traditional conventional vanadium plant at White Mesa, uh, located just out of Blanding. Uh, we're the largest producer of vanadium, um, including the recyclers in 2019. Uh, rare earths is uh, moving very quickly for us, and I'll give you an update on that as I go into the presentation. There is U.S. government support for critical materials of all types and materials, um, you know, that we become overly dependent on, on particularly state-owned enterprises around the world. Uh, and I believe there's bipartisan support for critical materials and minerals. Uh, we have, for a, a, a relatively small company, we have a, a significant financial strength and zero debt. Uh, and if you added up all our assets and had to replicate them, it'd probably be somewhere in the order of a billion dollars of assets. Um, our footprint is, is, is large from Wyoming all the way down to South Texas. Uh, the stars, the two green stars are in situ recovery uh, uranium projects that are currently on standby. Uh, the blue star is our conventional uh, White Mesa mill, uh, the only remaining operable conventional mill in the United States. And then we have sort of a, a hub of properties uh, both conventional and ISR properties uh, around some of these uh, facilities. I just want to remind people, because <clears throat> most people don't understand that 20% of the electricity in the United States comes from nuclear, and that is 55% of the clean energy. So uh, in order to reduce carbon emissions, um, you know, you got to have nuclear uh, in the mix. Um, Again, our, 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 our flagship assets, White Mesa Mill, uh, and this mill has been around for about 40 years. Uh, it's produced about $2 billion uh, in today's dollars at current metal prices uh, of uranium vanadium. Uh, over the course of that, I actually worked for the original energy fuels, uh, which was privately held by the Adams family, um, uh, Bob Adams, who got his start in, in Wyoming. So um, this is where we're planning to recover rare earths, and we're currently doing that uh, as we speak, and I'll show a video in a minute. But then our in-situ recovery, which, which back 40 years ago, there, were, there was very limited in-situ recovery in the United States for uranium, uh, but Nichols Ranch is a fairly new project, um, and Alta Mesa in South Texas is a, a still new relative to White Mesa. Uh, and then um, down at the bottom, um, is our pinion plain mine. Uh, we used to call it canyon mine, but the environmentalists uh, abused that name uh, so much over the years, we changed it to pinion plain. And as you can see in that picture, it's on a plane, it's not in the Grand Canyon. Um, I actually constructed that head frame in the 80s and uh, went off for 20 years to Australia, Southern Africa, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and where not, whatnot, uh, and have returned. and. Um, uh, it's still uh, in the eyes and the sights of the environmental group uh, and has been 
the only uh, project I know that has been uh, appealed up to the Supreme Court twice, and we're perhaps on our third uh, 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 appeal to the Supreme Court as we speak, it uh, sooner with regard to the appeal process. Um, this is something that we're very excited about. Um, as I mentioned, the rare earths, um, we've been doing rare earth testing. We just announced we are going to um, uh, enter the rare earth sector um, just in April, and we're making huge progress there. And uh, this is a video of what we believe is the first um, a rare earth carbonate concentrate uh, produced from monazite streams in the United States um, probably in the last 20 years. And this is off a of filter press at Wine Mesa. And it was a one ton uh, sample of monazite. And those in the rare sector will know that this is a very significant event that just happened uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, we're testing another three tons. Um, and But we do believe we'll be able to enter uh, commercial operations for rare earth carbonate um, production uh, in 2021. Um, the reason we can enter um, the rare earth space quicker is that uh, we have license to, to, to um, process uranium ores. And a lot of the rare earth um, uh, ore streams uh, uh, contain a substantial amount of uranium. Um, and the uranium uh, can be recovered at White Mesa Mill. And at, uh, as a consolation prize, we can recover the rare earth. So again, this is a very unique uh, position to be in. Uh, the only other place this is currently being done in the world is in China by CNNC. And uh, as we emerge as being able to do this at commercial scale, um, this is something that we believe uh, a number of people that have monocyte feed streams uh, will take note to, particularly because it's in the United States. Um, uh, so really our, our, um, our main focus is on the monocytes. Uh, monocyte was used as a, as a feed stream, um, not just in the United States, but around the world for a number of years. It was, it was um, basically um, uh, ignored or because of the uh, uranium content, uh, but this is our core business. We've been doing this for 40 years, recovering uranium. And so this is why we're such a unique position at, um, um, at White Mesa. Um, so we're actively in uh, discussions uh, with potential supply agreements from people that have monocytes to supply to White Mesa. And we're also in uh, discussions and negotiations for people to buy the concentrate from us. Uh, there is no separation capability in the United States at this point in time. Uh, but uh, we believe that um, in time uh, with adequate quantities of feed, um, that White Mesa is an ideal place uh, to do this. Um, we've joined with uh, a number of uh, different groups uh, so that not only are, are historically we've been a uranium vanadium producer, but, but treating this, this uranium ore with the rare earths, uh, we know what we don't know. Uh, we've got a relationship. We signed a letter of intent with Neo Performance Materials. Uh, and the CEO of that is Constantine Kirianopoulos. Some of you may have heard of Constantine. Constantine's the most successful person in the rare earth space in the world. He sold NEO back in 2012 to Molycor for about $1.3 billion. And so we have access to uh, Constantine and, and a number of his technical staff. Uh, we also recently got an award from the U.S. Department of Energy for coal-based resources, which complements uh, the processing that we're currently doing at White Mesa. Uh, we also signed up um, Brock O'Kelly, and some of you may know Brock. Uh, Brock worked uh, at Mountain Pass for about 35 years, and he's currently a associate professor at the Colorado School of Mines focusing on rare earth processing. And then Jack Lipton uh, has been in the rare earth industry for decades. So um, we have a facility. We're looking for sources of monazite. Um, and uh, we've got the right people in the right places that have a um, decades of experience and successful operation of rare earth uh, projects. And it's a very difficult space, just like your vanadium is difficult, but we know uh, that it's important to have the right people and the right expertise. Um, so the, the advantage is that, you know, we're, we're able to use our existing infrastructure to produce rare earth concentrate 
Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a facility, as I said, it's been around for about 40 years. Uh, it's got state-of-the-art disposal facilities. It's got um, um, uh, tailings site uh, disposal, uh, which is triple line, uh, state-of-the-art uh, design for a thousand years at RICRA standards. And so we, we, we believe that having access and availability of this existing uh, infrastructure in this long history is just uh, uh, almost too good to be true, um, but uh, it is true. And we believe we will be able to be in a position commercially to be cash positive with rare earths uh, within 12 months. And some of you would have seen that the president did sign in October an executive order declaring um, some of these cr critical uh, minerals a uh, national emergency. And again, we believe that um, you know this is going to have bipartisan support even with the change of government. Uh, in addition, and something that our company has been front and center on, uh, we're working on advancing a, um, a U.S. uranium reserve. Uh, this is something that that uh, as a, we took a lead as a, as a, in the industry of uranium because we're you know rare earths uranium vanadium. Uh, it is um, been put into the uh, 2021 budget. That's 150 million dollars per year for 10 years. Uh, we're currently working through the appropriations process with Congress uh, in a bipartisan way, and there seems to be support because um, the Democrats know they cannot. Uh, reduce carbon emissions substantially without supporting nuclear. We also were uh, a significant participant in getting the Russian suspension agreement extended, and that will reduce uh, um, uh, imports of uh, Russian uranium into the United States, reducing from the current 20% uh, down to 15% in time. And uh, I just want to, and I already talked about it a little bit, but um, there is bipartisan support for nuclear and first time since 1972. Um, uranium market, it's been tough. It's been tough since Fukushima. Uh, uh, the price of uranium has gone up a bit. Uh, the growth for uh, nuclear fuel is increasing. It's not increasing like five, six percent per year, but it is increasing one or two percent per year. Uh, during COVID, the price did go up uh, relatively substantially, not high enough to go back into uranium production but there were a number of supply impacts. But meanwhile, the long-term supply risks for the uranium market um, are growing uh, with the persistent low prices. A number of projects continue to shut down. Uh, there's a lack of investment, new production, new investment. Uh, so we think this bodes well for the uranium business, which is first and foremost, our core business as energy fuels. But, um, so we think, again, it's a very bright market for uranium. Um, just uh, to, to put it into context that the demand uh, uh, outstripped production of uranium in 2020 as estimated by uh, Trade Tech by 69 million pounds, which is about 35%. So that's a substantial shortfall of new production. And there's nearly a billion pounds of uncovered demand through 2030. Um, in addition to to uranium and our emerging uh, rare earth production capabilities. Um, Energy Fuels, as I said, was the largest producer of vanadium in 2019. Uh, we produced nearly 2 million pounds of, um, of vanadium. We still have about 1.7 million pounds uh, in inventory. At current prices, that's about 9 million. Uh, we still have another uh, nearly 3 million pounds that we can recover to, from our tailings um, uh, uh, facility. Uh, there's also um, a petition, a Section 232 petition for reducing imports of vanadium into the United States as well. That was not initiated by energy fuels, but we have been participating with that. Um, not to, again, the, the, this form, but, you know, kind of where we sit in terms of our peer, peer group in North America. Um, and, uh, you know, we're about the middle of the road there. We have a very strong working capital position, zero debt. Uh, but really a differentiator between the other uranium companies is one uh, we do in situ recovery and conventional uranium production. We're the only ones that produce vanadium. We're the only ones that have what we call alternate feed where we can process natural uranium uh, and, and convert it into the, um, nuclear fuel. And we're the only ones that um, 
are emerging as a rare earth producer. And so really kind of watch this space as we go forward over the next few months and the next year or so. Um, this is an interesting graph. It just shows where uranium production has come out of the United States in the last 15 years. Uh, the light blue is Cameco Corporation. Um, the blue is energy fuels assets. Um, the lighter blue is uh, UR Energy, another um, uranium producer, and then uranium one is the red. Uh, between Cameco and our company and our assets, we produced 85% of the uranium in the United States and much of that through White Mesa in Utah. Um, another thing that w uh, we're, we're pursuing that uh, we're really excited about in, in, in time is the cleanup of abandoned uranium mines uh, on the Navajo Nation. This is the four corners. The little blue star is where White Mesa is, uh, just south of Blanding. Um, you can see the four corners with you know Utah, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. Um, there are a number of those red dots, so the red spots are abandoned uranium mines that either were not ever reclaimed or reclaimed poorly that the EPA has collected $1.7 billion in trust uh, to clean up those operations. Uh, we think that White Mesa with our triple line RICRA uh, facilities, which um, currently we have two constructed cells and we have two more that we have permitted, uh, will give us well over 5 million tons of um, either constructed or permitted capacity uh, at White Mesa. The little green star down by Albuquerque and Grants is a private uranium project that we're currently assisting um, uh, taking the low level, um, low grade ores from that facility is actually Mount Taylor. Some of you will remember Mount Taylor in the days of Chevron. Um, we are currently taking material uh, from Mount Taylor to White Mesa because we're fully permitted to do that. So, you know, we're already doing it with the private site. Um, so there is really no reason other than some political reason. A lot of the environmental groups um, don't want to clean up the, the Navajo Nation. They'd rather uh, point this um, finger at the industry uh, as legacy issues. And we're uh, ready to, to participate and help clean up uh, these legacy issues for all the right reasons. Half our employees are Native Americans at uh, White Mesa. Uh, we've also volunteered to do one of the, the cleanups uh, on the Navajo Nation for free just to get the, the ball rolling there. But this is really an outstanding outcome uh, for the Navajo Nation and the industry for us to work together to come up with a, uh, a solution to fix some of these legacy sites. So uh, this is something that uh, we're still trying to pursue in addition to uranium, vanadium, and rare earths. Um, I won't talk about this much because of the audience, but look, at we're, we're, we're still a small company. We've got these substantial inventories of uranium and vanadium. Uh, we've got a fairly strong cash position, all things considered, and we're, we have zero debt. Uh, we'll produce nearly 200,000 pounds of vanadium or uranium this year, uh, which is the largest in the United States. And that is just about uh, a third or fourth of what is required to fuel one reactor uh, in the United States, which is really pretty sad when you think about it. Um, in addition, we've got some um, conventional mines that are we considered on core that we're trying to uh, divest at this point in time. Uh, some of those have, uh, well, they, they all, three of them have permits uh, and a long production history of production. Um, so really in closing, um, Utah is a, a very important place for our company. It's a friendly place to do business relative to some of the neighbors. Um, I mean, certainly Wyoming, uh, Texas, Utah, very favorable. And I won't name some of the other locations that we do business in that are not so favorable, but we have substantial assets. As I said, nearly a billion dollars worth of assets. Uh, we can go into production quicker, faster than um, just about anybody else, actually quicker than anybody else. Uh, the rare earth opportunity is truly exciting because we think that White Mesa, uh, you know, can play a very significant role there with a the long history of recovering uranium. Um, we have a strong balance sheet. Um, we're evaluating some divestment and, uh, you know, the various uh, elements of the optionality of our company and critical materials, uranium, vanadium, rare earths, uh, and some of this cleanup work and alternate feed puts us in a very uh, unique position as a company, not just in the United States, 
but actually in the world. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions um, if anybody has questions. Well, well thank you, Mark. Uh, running a little over, so I, I would suggest if you do have some questions, you might uh, shoot them to uh, the Mining Association, and they can definitely get them to the authors. Um, really appreciated your talk, Mark. Uh, brings back a little memories. Uh, I spent a little time in the Mount Taylor mine, and I remember it being quite warm and uh, when we were doing a conversion of some products, and, and also the old pigeon mine. That'll bring a little memory back to you. Uh, in the late 80s, I spent some time down by the canyon, so uh, kind of interesting to hear those. Uh, dating myself, but uh, they were good times. Um, just yeah, wanted well, to... We're, we're, we're still around, we're still around, and um, you know, we have you know, some important infrastructure, and, um, but it's you know, still a difficult time for survival for not just uranium and critical materials, but all mining. Yeah, you're still hanging in there, and that's great to see. You know, you can hang that long. That's a good sign. Um, just wanted to thank all the presenters again today. Excellent uh, uh, presentations, and uh, um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a great, uh, great afternoon. Our pleasure.